Let's consider the two vector spaces, r cubed, which is the space of all height 3 column vectors whose entries come from the real numbers r, and c, which is the space of all width 3 row vectors whose entries come from r. Of course, these things are not equal. One of them consists of column vectors, the other of row vectors, those things are different. But they are very closely related. They're both made up, or elements of both of those vector spaces are made up of three real numbers, just recorded in a different way. And in fact, they have exactly the same properties as vector spaces. They're vector spaces over the same field, namely the real numbers. They have the same dimension. They have all the same properties. So how can we make precise this idea of two vector spaces having exactly the same properties as vector spaces, even though they may be represented in different ways? The answer is through the notion of a vector space isomorphism, which is the subject of this video. Here's the definition of a vector space isomorphism. If you have two vector spaces, U and V, over the same field, F must be the same field, then a function t from u to v is called an isomorphism if it has the following two properties. It must be a linear map, linear function, and it must be a bijection, so one-to-one -one and onto. Now if we have two vector spaces u and v and an isomorphism t from u to v, then we write u and then this symbol, which is an equal sign with a wiggly line on top, and then v, or we say u is isomorphic to v. So both that symbol and the sentence u is isomorphic to v mean there exists an isomorphism from u to v. So in the case of the two vector spaces we just saw, it's very easy to see an isomorphism between them. You could write down your function t as t from r cubed to c just given by turning a row vector, a column vector rather, into a row vector in the obvious way. That is linear and a bijection, so it's isom an isomorphism. You can check really easily that those properties hold um, linearity and being a bijection. We're going to prove a lemma about isomorphisms, which tells us that the notion of two vector spaces being isomorphic is symmetric. It will tell us that if u is isomorphic to v, then v is isomorphic to u. What the lemma says exactly is that if t from u to v is an isomorphism, then its inverse function, which exists because an isomorphism is a bijection and bijections are invertible, is also an isomorphism of vector spaces. So to prove this, I have to show that t inverse has both of the properties in the definition of being an isomorphism. It's got to be linear and it's got to be a bijection. But one of those, the second one, follows immediately from what we know about inverse functions. Specifically, we know that the inverse of a bijection is again a bijection. So certainly T inverse is a bijection. What I need to do is show that it has the two linearity properties. For the first linearity property, the one about addition, let's pick two elements x and y in v. What I have to do is show that t inverse of x plus y is equal to t inverse of x plus t inverse of y. To help us do that, let's notice that t 
being a bijection is onto. So both x and y are in the image of t. That means there are elements u and v in u such that t of u equals x and t of v equals y. The reason this helps us is as follows. If we look at t inverse of x plus y, well that's t inverse of t of u plus t of v. Now we don't know that t inverse is linear yet, but we do know that t was linear because it was an isomorphism. So t of u plus t of v is t of u plus v. Now I have t inverse of t of u plus v. So by definition of the inverse function, that's u plus v. OK, but take a look at this equation. That tells you that u is equal to t inverse of x. And this tells me that v is t inverse of y. So this is t inverse of x plus t inverse of y. Uh, we have now shown that t inverse satisfies the first linearity property. For the second linearity property, the one about scalar multiples, let's suppose we have an element L of the field over which u and v are vector spaces. And we'll again take an element x in v. For the same reason as before, x is t of u for some u in u. Now what I need to show is that t inverse of L times x is equal to L times t inverse of x. So let's just look at t inverse of Lx and use the same trick we did before. This is the same as t inverse of L times t of u. And because t is known to be linear, it's, that's our assumption, that's t inverse of t of Lu. So this is just Lu again, and as before, that's L times t inverse of x. We've verified the second linearity property for t inverse, so it's a linear, it's a bijection, so it's an isomorphism. I'm going to justify the statement I made about isomorphic vector spaces having the same dimension. So here's the statement. If u is isomorphic to v, then the dimension of u is equal to the dimension of v. Now one way to prove this is you can prove that if you have a basis u1 up to un of u, then t of u1 up to t of un is a basis of v. That's a direct proof of this. But since we went to all the trouble of proving the rank nullity theorem, we're going to use the rank nullity theorem to get a shorter proof than that direct one. So recall the rank nullity theorem. Which says that if t from u to v is linear, then the dimension of the kernel of t plus the dimension of the image of t equals the dimension of the domain of t. So we're going to use this to make our proof work. OK. If u is isomorphic to v, then that means there is an isomorphism from u to v. And our proof is going to consist of applying the rank nullity formula to t. So we're going to identify all of the things on the left-hand side of the rank nullity formula, the kernel of t and the image of t in their dimensions. <laughs> 
So first of all, I claim that the kernel of t is just the zero vector in u. So we know that for any linear map, the image of the zero vector in the domain is equal to the zero vector in the codomain. Now, if you have any element of the kernel of T, well, being in the kernel means by definition that T of X is equal to the zero vector in the codomain. But that's the same as T of the zero vector in the domain. Because T is an isomorphism, it's a bijection. Because it's a bijection, it's one to one. So because t of x is equal to t of the zero vector, x is equal to the zero vector. We have shown everything in the kernel is equal to the zero vector. And therefore the dimension of the kernel is zero. Let's now identify the image of T. Again, T is an isomorphism. An isomorphism must be a bijection. A bijection must be onto. If T is onto, then its image is the whole of its codomain. So the dimension of the image of T is equal to the dimension of V. So finally, let's just use the rank nullity for formula. It says that the dimension of the kernel of T plus the dimension of the image of T is equal to the dimension of the domain of T. 0 plus the dimension of V is equal to the dimension of U. That's proved the result that we wanted to prove. I'm going to finish up by proving what is perhaps a slightly disappointing result. At least some people tend to find this a little bit of a disappointment. What it says is that every finite dimensional vector space is actually isomorphic to a vector space of column vectors. To do this, or to, to give the proof, I'm going to need a fact from lecture 51, the basis lecture. So I'm going to remind you of that before we start the proof. So recall from lecture 51, on bases, if you have a vector space V and a basis V1 up to Vn, then you can write every element of V in one and only one way as a linear combination of V1 up to Vn. That said, let's start the proof. We're going to pick 
a basis for V. And we're going to call it V1 up to Vn. We define a linear map T from V to F to the N in the following way. We know that every element of V can be written as a linear combination of V1 up to Vn in only one way. So we'll define V on such a linear combination, sorry, we will define T on such a linear combination just to be the column vector whose first entry is the coefficient of V1, whose second entry is the coefficient of V2, and so on. Now the reason this linear map makes sense <coughs> is because of the fact that I've just reminded you of about bases. Like, for example, if you had n equals 2, let's say, and if you had, I don't know, let's say we had 2 times u1 was equal to um, 2 times u1 plus 3 times u2. Let's get these names right. 2 times v1 was equal to 2 times v1 plus 3 times v2 was equal to um, v1 minus 4 v2 then we'd have a real problem because t of the first of those would be equal to 2, 3 and t of the second one would be equal to 1, minus 4 and then if those things are supposed to be equal then t should take them to the same place so if that could happen we would have a real problem but we know that it can't because we chose a basis of V1 up to Vn, and what the result from lecture 51 said was that every element of V can be written in only one way as a linear combination of V1 up to Vn. So this cannot happen, and that means our function t really is a good definition, a definition that works of a function from V up to Fn. Anyway, let's now get rid of this and continue with our proof now that we know that the function t is well defined. We need to prove that t is a bijection and we need to prove that t is linear in order to show that it's an isomorphism. Let's begin by showing that it is onto. Well, that is actually easy because if you take any element in the codomain f to the n, then that is in the image of t because it is the image of the linear combination xi, vi. That shows every element of the codomain is in fact in the image, so the image of t is actually equal to f to the n. Now let's do one-to-oneness. Well, if you have two vectors, let's say the first one is equal to the linear combination L1V1 plus L2V2 and so on, and the second one is equal to the linear combination 
M1 V1 plus M2 V2 and so on and their images under T are equal then that means that L1 the vector L1 down to Ln is equal to the vector M1 down to Mn so actually if those two column vectors are equal then Li is equal to Mi for all i so the sum of the li vi's is actually precisely the same as the sum of the mi vi's. That means that t is 1 to 1. So the only thing left is to show that t is linear, which we're going to do on the next slide. So linearity comes in two parts. We have to show that T behaves nicely with respect to addition and with respect to scalar multiplication. So first of all, let's think about addition. We have to take two elements of our vector space V, which I know I can write as linear combinations of my basis. So we'll say Xi Vi, the sum from I equals one to N of xi vi and another another element of v like this i have to show that t of the sum of the xi vi's plus the sum of the yi vi's is equal to t of the x the sum of the xi vi's plus t of the sum of the yi vi's well we can just gather those vectors together so we can collect terms in v1 and v2 and v3 and if we do that what we get is the sum of xi plus yi times vi okay so this by definition is the vector whose first entry is x1 plus y1 and whose second entry is x2 plus y2 and so on. But the way addition of column vectors works is that this is the column vector containing the x's plus the column vector containing the y's which is again by definition of t, t of the xi vi's plus t of the yi vi's. Okay, so that's the first linearity property. t of a sum of two things is equal to the sum of t of those two things. Next we have to do the scalar multiple property for linearity. So again we will take a vector or an element xi vi in V, where the x's are scalars and the vi's are my basis elements, and a single scalar L in F. Once more, if we look at T of L times the sum of the xi vi's, well, I can multiply the scalar through the sum, and this is equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n of L times xi times vi. Now we've got a linear combination of v's where the coefficient of v1 is L times x1 and the coefficient of v2 is L times x2 and so on. So its image under t is this vector here. Now the way that scalar multiplication works in spaces of column vectors is that this is equal to L times the vector x1 down to xn and that is L times t of the sum of the xi vi's. So we've checked the second linearity property.
that means t is a bijection, t is linear, and so t is an isomorphism from v to f to the n. Therefore, every vector space of dimension n over a field f is isomorphic to f to the n.